Welcome to Startup Diaries, sponsored by Point Click Technologies. My name is Zainab Sise, and this is a new series highlighting 10 Gambian founders and their startup stories. Each episode has an in-depth interview with the founder, highlighting their ups and downs throughout their journey. Whether you are in the Gambia or somewhere out there in the diaspora, this show is for you. Please do not forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you never miss out. If you have any questions or comments, please put them down below as we would love to hear from you. Enjoy the show. Hi, my name is Hassan. I'm founder and chief software architect of Asotech, a software engineering company that specializes in bringing meaningful technological innovations to the masses to improve the quality of life. We specialize in building cross-platform software solutions for multi-level organizations and um, augmenting, uh, cross, providing cross-functional teams for software engineering companies around the world. So we were founded in 2015 and um, our first official year was 2017. Um, we started in a bedroom and we grew to a team of 15 as of the time of filming this and counting. Yeah, so I started the company uh, in my bedroom a couple of years ago. Um, and then later on, I invited uh, our first two uh, team members to join. Yeah, so I think that, um, you know, historically all great pro products are a solution to a problem, right? So a couple of years ago, um, a friend of mine told me about an institution that is using a typewriter to do something and they're interested in modernizing that solution. So I had a discussion with them and um, I ended up building the software all by myself, um, the whole thing end to end, and I showed it to them and they were very excited. They bought it and um, since then I thought, okay, there probably are many institutions who are going to need business process uh, automation suites to um, increase their productivity, uh, save time, and enable them to provide quality service. So the system is still in use today in 2022. Um, this is from 2015. Um, so um, since then, um, I, I figured, okay, I think if this institution, if this software would have this amount of impact on the way they, they, they transact, I imagine there are so many other institutions in the country who could, who could find this very useful. And the rest is history, as they say. Um, we focused then on um, how do you now use technology to, to make work easier for people, increase productivity, save time, uh, maximize profitability for businesses of all sizes? Yeah, so I think the services we do are demand-driven. So it, it re really, the whole process starts from understanding what problem needs to be solved or what needs to be made more convenient, right? So it's usually that that is what drives um, the services that we offer. So generally, we are a software engineering company. Um, but whatever is required end-to-end -to, -end to make sure that a process is complete and a problem is addressed sufficiently and then to create uh, maximum benefit for the client or to give all the stakeholders a complete cycle of benefit, that is really what drives the services that we provide. I mean, with, with complete honesty, I did not imagine, I did not do any sort of market research. I think it just turns out that at the time I loved coding, I loved writing software, I loved solving problems. And here was an institution that solved the problem. And, and then I said, okay, you could get paid for something that you love doing. So that's really how it started. But naturally, it evolved to something uh, more meaningful than that. So I didn't really um, do before this to say any market research to say that, um, okay, this is the business to start. But it was more driven by the needs of the market. And then it just grew from that standpoint. So interestingly, we have zero marketing budget. Um, and we've been busy since when we started. Um, the, the way we have grown has been word of mouth, right? Um, our goal has been, how do you run a company from the smallest country in mainland Africa that can deliver nothing less than anything else you're going to find anywhere else in the world from a software standpoint? So I like this quote by Aristotle, um, which is that we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act but a habit. So we've just focused on products that, or projects that we work on that have maximum impact and then we can deliver it to the best way we possibly can. And then from there, we have grown basically by word of mouth. Um, some of our biggest clients today were directed, were introduced to us by another client that we have. So we now are at a stage that we are ready to scale up. And 
um, we, we, we are introducing some, pro introducing some product lines where we will be leveraging uh, a lot of um, interesting marketing techniques, especially in the um, uh, social media and uh, digital marketing space. So um, that is where we would be putting a lot of effort in. I mean, if you look at the internet growth rate and you look at the demographics of the country and you look at um, how people are interacting with these platforms today, um, I think it, it, it's a no-brainer that that would be a very effective um, way to, 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 for customer acquisition in terms of a product. So our sales is not volume. So our, do we, our business model is not on volumes, right? So, and like I said, word of mouth has been sufficient to keep us busy uh, for quite a bit. Um, for the products that we would we 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 we're, we're launching now, like Widget is one of the products that we are launching. We would be doing a lot of consumer marketing, but the kinds of sales we do now is mostly looking at businesses that are strategically aligned in a way that software could really help them improve in all aspects of their business. So we proactively reach out to these businesses and try to propose to them what the possibilities are. That is, after learning about the challenges that they face as an institution. So because of our business model is not volume based, so um, word of mouth and also proactively reaching out to some of these customers uh, has been uh, enough uh, to keep us busy. Because we, we can't possibly take like too many projects and just spin it out fast and take the next one. Because like I said, our, 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 our goal really is, to, is more the, the impact that the project would have. Obviously, this usually translates to uh, a lot more business incentive because the projects are uh, usually bigger, um, but it hasn't been um, say, making marketing um, uh, and, and sales uh, to, to customers uh, on, a, on a large scale. But this is definitely something that we are transitioning into as a company as we scale up and continue to have the capacity that is required to be able to address all of these um, opportunities, take advantage, of, uh, take advantage of all of these opportunities. You know, I, I didn't even think I was running a business, right? So I was a student, second year in university, uh, coding the night away, every day, all day, and I was, I, I was writing software for an institution, and I didn't think I had a job, you know? So, and I never really worked anywhere before that. Um, I was just a student, and then I, you know, worked on this project for this big institution, and um, and then from there, um, you know, it went on and on. But I think in terms of logistics and structure, I got a lot of help. I have a lot of mentors that I talk to um, to seek advice and counsel about how to go about a business. And you know, today I have a very solid team um, of of mentors and advisors who've been very supportive over the years. We have a very solid board who offers guidance in terms of how do you really run a business from a corporate standpoint? Um, from a business standpoint, how do you have the standards and best practices? So I've got a lot of support in that regard. I've also gone through a lot of entrepreneurship training programs that have been very supportive. I've, I was also part of an incubator, startup incubator Gambia a couple of, many years ago. Um, I read a lot of books. Um, about business or pretty much anything that I can get my hands on. Um, so that really has been very helpful. And also watch, you know, what the rest of the world is doing. What I call uh, not horizontal benchmarking, but vertical benchmarking. Look at what the rest of the world is doing. And a couple of years ago, I had an opportunity as part of a fellowship to work at a data analytics company in Silicon Valley. And I, I get to see really where the heart of technology in the world, how things happen and how the sausage is made and that was one of the most insightful experiences of my life. And the goal has always been, how do you make sure that you set up a company that's no less, at least at the scale at which we, can, we are capable of executing, at no less than what, it, what you would find in Silicon Valley in terms of the experiences, in terms of um, what you have access to, um, in terms of the technologies, um, in terms of the office, office spaces. So this really has been how we have been driving um, how we um, progress um, as a company. So yeah, so I think that has been um, quite interesting. Most amazing things about um, Astrotech, which I can't take credit for, I think we're just lucky, is really the team, right? So there are 15 people that work here at the moment, some of the smartest people that I've ever met. 
Um, so some of them did extremely well, you know, academically. Some of them, you know, just completed high school and went online and taught themselves to code. So really, out of that 15, I have never what I call given an interview per se. That's, um, that's how I call it. I've never looked at any kind of document or, I mean, I know somebody, I take somebody's word for it when they tell me they graduate. Um, and I know they, they, they most likely did, but it really doesn't matter. I don't want to see a diploma or something. What we're really looking for is, are you hungry enough for two things? Primarily, are you hungry enough for knowledge? Are you hungry enough for success? So this is what we look at. Because historically, what we have seen is that if somebody is hungry enough to learn and they're hungry enough to succeed, they really do, they're autonomous, right? They'll do whatever it takes that falls within legal and ethical boundaries to make sure that um, the company grows. And we provide all the incentives that is required for, for them to, to want to do that, right? So, so, you know, we don't believe in macro-management. So we typically hire somebody who is going to tell us something that we don't know about, right? Um, and that is really has been um, our, our strategy for, 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 for hiring. Um, so, and um, we have never really had advertised a job per se. But what we truly believe is that whenever we find talent, we will hire you first and then figure out what we're going to do, what we're going to do, what we're going to do with us for work later. Because we are constantly looking for top talent. And I'm really grateful with the people that I work with. I get to learn from them every day. So, and in terms of our, um, the way we work as a company, it's highly flexible. Our focus has always been more on productivity than merely your presence. So we make the workplace very interesting. So for example, one of the fun things we do is, um, we figured that only two people knew how to swim in the company. So we said, okay, we'll get a swimming instructor and then we'll teach everybody how to swim. So at the moment, almost everybody knows how to swim, which is quite nice, uh, an amazing bonding activity. You know, and um, we have free lunch, um, we have snacks, you can eat, you can literally eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I think, uh, from our kitchenette. <laughs> um, you know, we have, we, we have free gym, you can go work out, for, we'll pay for it. So, I mean, and we, it, it's usually driven by what the team really wants. And we have so many interesting things that we want to do just to, to help people grow. So, the idea is not, oh, we're just going to create all these incentives, but it's more like, how do we help the team grow in every way? both professionally and, um, and, and otherwise, all the skills that they have. And we have a lot of bonding activities. And you know, um, we don't have a lot of rigidity in the way we execute as a company. And we are really open to feedback. And it's more like everybody has a say in whatever it is that we want to do. So it's, it's been quite interesting. So it's, it's a constantly um, uh, evolving environment where like every single day, you can't help it, but you have to learn something from one of your colleagues. So it's quite, quite amazing. And one of the things I found very um, common for high performance people is the, the desire to learn. So normally what I found out is some of the talent we have really magnetizes talent. So when I talk to people who I think have a lot of potential, and I tell them about the other team members and their accomplishments and what they have been able to do, it really um, incentivizes, it, it makes them want to be part of the team, and that really makes me very happy. And I have this um, sandwich uh, that, that I make that I think um, um, it's very, very interesting that, that they like uh, Nutella with cheese. Um, some of my team members think it's... it's, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, I would, just, I would not use their words, but I would say whack. But, but I think it tastes really nice. Um, yeah, so you, can't, you don't want to miss that. First off, um, when it comes to dealing with clients, our rule of thumb is we, because we always talk about this in the company, we say, if we care more about our clients than our competitors, then we will be, always keep our client. So we genuinely care about the success of our clients even more than the financial incentive. Because the reason for that is the success of our clients, we believe directly translates to the financial incentive for us. So that's one. And two, you know, one of the things about running a business, you always have to do the things the right way. That's it. It's not, 
you know, it's not like you're having a conversation outside. And yes, you, you, you have these conversations and, and everything, but n normally you, you have to formalize the, the conversations and the agreements that you have. And yes, the lawyers can be involved in, 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 in the process of putting together the documentation to bind the agreements together, right? So, so that's, that's pretty standard. But initially when we started, um, certainly it wasn't like that. But it's, it's really helpful from the very onset of your company to organize stuff, like at a corporate setting. I mean, the, 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 so there's, there's a thin line, really. Um, the times that people focus too much on structure and as a small company, and then it stifles growth, right? And there are certain times that people have no structure at all, and they're highly disorganized. So as a small company, you have to set it up in a way that you have sufficient bureaucracy that you are not disorganized, but also not too much bureaucracy that is, uh, slows down your growth, depending really on the stage of your company, and uh, from business to business, really. So because if, if you're selling shocks, um, you probably don't need uh, a contract if you're selling um, a pair of socks to somebody. Um, but depending on what kind of, if it's, if it's a service that you're providing, um, then you probably need a contract. You know, one would imagine that what is your startup cost should be an obvious answer, right? But for me, really, like I mentioned earlier, I didn't think I was starting a business. I didn't have any money, really. Um, I had a laptop, I had a computer, I had books, I had internet, and I had tons of energy and some coffee. So really, I don't remember setting aside money and saying that, um, okay, I'm going to use this money to start a business, right? So obviously, the accountants will tell you, or the finance guy, yeah, certainly you had a startup cost. But I don't remember putting aside money and saying, okay, I'm going to use this money to start a business. What I do remember, however, is 500 dollars that was used to register the business, right? Um, but the startup cost was minimal. So, and what we have done over the years is to literally invest every single, every penny we made back in the business, right? So um, that has really helped us grow, and it has really helped us to be uh, very financially disciplined in terms of how we manage finances, and also getting a lot of help from people um, who've worked with companies that we know uh, to give us some advice in terms of uh, what are the most optimal ways to do certain things. So, so really, the startup cost was very minimal. So we've never had a grant or a had a loan ever, and we have never raised money since. Um, this is definitely something that we would be uh, looking into in the very near future. Um, but we have had a lot of support from support systems. Like, for example, we've done a lot of work for YEP. We've got a lot of support from that. So things like that really have been helpful. And I've also gotten a lot of support, obviously, from friends and family, especially um, you know, in providing their time, in making their resources available, etc. So um, I've really uh, gotten a lot of support. And you know, early on uh, with Waka and Jonga, uh, we really uh, grinded very well, um, putting in the hours, whatever it takes, for us to get the projects done so that we can keep the company going. You know, challenges are part of the process, right? I mean, if you look at the nature of our work in itself, it's problem solving. So when, when a challenge comes, instinctively what we think about is just, okay, that's part of the process, so let's solve it. You know, I, I grew up in the North Bank, um, in a village called SL, and I remember I used to be very curious as a child, and I used to like opening up electronics. And, you know, some of the most rudimentary tools were the hardest for me to get, and that was a screwdriver. So naturally, my, you know, I had to make a screwdriver or borrow my, uh, uh, my, my, my brother's screwdriver. Um, so you know, naturally, my programming is you want to do something, what you need to do it is not there completely. So it's just normal and part of the process. But I think um, when it comes to the challenges, really, the first one I would say would be You know, how do you convince an institution that they really need the software? Like, you know, they've been doing something manually, and, you know, without actually showing them something, how do you convince them that, oh, actually software is going to solve your problem? Especially in the early days where, you know, people are not too familiar with using software solutions to solve some of their business problems. Or at least looking at the cost and thinking, maybe this doesn't make sense. So that was one challenge. The way we did that at the time, we built a sample, and we showed them. The sample allows them to put things in context and be able to visualize it in a more accurate way. And that has really worked very well. I mean, today we don't need to do that because we have just so much to show for work that we have done. So second is obviously the financial challenge. Like how do you run a company with no money, right? 
So you do things on the fly. And um, um, it's not like we haven't tried to raise money. We have tried to raise money a couple of times unsuccessfully, which we are very happy it went out that way. Um, um, so, so what did we do? We worked on projects and we invest everything and be financially disciplined. We, uh, we, we live way beneath our means and know it's just a matter of time before uh, things work out right. And the third one is getting talent, right? So we, we're looking for somebody who, who's going to come and tell us um, show us something that we don't know how to do, right? Um, we're looking for, so it's, it's very hard for our expectations and the, the level at which we want to deliver to find um, the exact software engineering time that matches that. But we always see potential. So when we see potential, we say, here are the resources, here's the path. You go and learn, and learn the standards and best practices. Learn how Google and Facebook do it, and come and tell us. And then, you know, we have a lot of experienced engineers who can now um, um, calibrate this uh, in a way. So um, that has really worked out for us uh, well uh, in the past. But now, the rate at which we're growing, um, we're going to need probably a bit more um, ready uh, software engineers so we can be able to execute more uh, um, faster. But until today, we still have a program that helps uh, nurture talent wherever we see it, provide opportunities that they need end to end uh, to, to, to make sure that they reach a certain level that we can um, uh, absorb them into the team. So really, challenges are, are part of the process, and it's really nothing that I, uh, I, I think about a lot. For some reason, every single challenge that we have experienced has an opportunity. It's either a learning opportunity or a business opportunity. So I don't, for some reason, inside the challenge, you know, there's a relationship between the challenge and the opportunity. For example, if, if you think about it, the Apple one by Steve Wozniak, um, he did not come up with that design because of, it was primarily because of challenges in finding and the limitations in being able to find all the resources that he needs to, to make uh, the, the circuit board. But then, because he, the, the resources were limited, he had to find a very innovative way to make something work. And this has really worked so well in, in our favor. So in every challenge that you see, there's always an opportunity, or at least a learning opportunity that you're going to get in, in it. So the whole idea of growing, you see, the physical things is not really the goal, like growing the team, making a lot, tons of money. That's a side effect. That, that's why we're doing it, um, for the most part, for what we can do with it. But that's just a side effect for really the vision and where we, where we want to be. Bringing meaningful technological innovations to the masses to improve the quality of life on the African continent. Yeah, sometimes it doesn't even have to be advanced technology, right? Sometimes it's just, because you see, technology just amplifies the goals of people. So if your goal is one thing and you leverage technology, it can amplify it. But if your goal is otherwise, technology would not work, right? So sometimes it's not sophisticated and advanced technology, which we can leverage. But at the level we are, instead of just looking at what the rest of the world is doing and just replicate, we just look at our context and look at the, our challenges and opportunities and build software around that both software and hardware, really. And um, so it really comes down to sometimes very simple things that you would put in to increase efficiency, to increase productivity, to increase uh, your market reach, right? To be more targeted in the way you execute. So sometimes it doesn't have to be, I mean, we, we have a machine learning and AI and machine learning team. And you know, they have been doing a lot of research uh, for the past few years. And I am just blown away by just some of the things that come up. But, you know, we are getting ready for the potential applications of these technologies. But really, at this point, there are just some really basic and rudimentary things that we need to solve. And that's where we are focused on now. And then the next stages will be how do we leverage um, deep tech, um, uh, very high tech, to be able to augment where we are at the moment. For somebody trying to start a business in the Gambia, I think the first step is, you know, start, especially for a young Gambian having an idea. Um, so my first advice is to get started, right? Um, because ideally what you want to do is you want to look for a problem to solve. And you want to solve it better than everybody else, right? Um, so, you know, the first step is really to get started and um, look for a problem to solve. Um, get the best and settle for nothing less. That's one, build a team, build a very solid team. 
mostly focus on people who are, uh, are smarter than you, really, or people who know something that you don't. Because the reality is everybody you speak to certainly knows something that you don't. But you really need to find people who augment your area of weakness. So, because if you put that together as a team, really, uh, that makes a huge difference. I mean, if you think about it, a company as Asotec, I think there's nothing that we have produced that one person can just sit down and get it done. It's always been like teamwork, right? Like we have like some of the most, some of the sharpest people that I've ever met that when they come together, when you aggregate all of that work together, it just translates to something really powerful. So it should be, you know, you want to start by um, uh, building a very solid team. The third one is, um, you know, get as much knowledge as you can, right? Talk to people um, who are very experienced and take your thoughts. I mean, they'll give you their ideas, but you really have to have a sound judgment in making uh, your decisions ultimately, really. But